Dr. Holmes, thanks so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited that we have this conference right here at Stanford. I'm excited too. It's, it's great. What has been your favorite thing that you've seen so far? Well, I haven't seen a lot, but I'm interested in genomics, so that was something that I was interested in. But a lot of people are local, so we have an area where there's this interaction between data analysis and medicine. One of the things I read about you is that you've said you liked working with big, messy data sets, which I love. I think it's such a great way to describe it. What does that mean for someone who, who isn't a data scientist? What's a big, messy data set? Well, it's mostly the messy has to do with how heterogeneous the data are. That is, many different types. And so sometimes I do brain scans combined with genetics mm. or data on the microbiome where we have counts at the same time as we have networks and phylogenies. And clinical information about patients. So for me, the big challenge isn't big. I'm not interested in big. I think that's a male thing to go around. My data is bigger than your data. But as a woman, I see the point of view is that the data are very messy, heterogeneous, and you have to be very patient. So, so in other you words, to... you're not comparing, say, blood pressure to blood pressure. You're comparing or, or integrating a brain scan right. with someone's genetic makeup, their family wow. history, and uh, their behavior. And so you want to take many different types of data. It's not the big, which I find difficult, it's the different types. Hmm. So we call it heterogeneous data or heterogeneity in the data. And so that, I think that's one of our challenges. Now you mentioned that you work with the microbiome, which I think is fascinating. The microbiome, at least in, in, the, in the lay press, people have been talking about it as, as a factor for not only gastrointestinal health, but also mental health. Yes. What kinds of things are, what projects are you working on? I work on several projects. One is the resistance to antibiotics mm. and what happens when you take antibiotics, it's a little bit like having a forest fire, mm. you know, out there, and then what grows back? So it kills all the bacteria in your yeah. intestines. And, and then what grows back and how quickly. Mm. And what's interesting is it is like a forest fire. That is, if you have several forest fires in a row, then only the weeds grow back. Mm. And for the intestine, Clostridium difficile and various kinds of very bad weeds grow back for certain people and not for others, and we want to know why. So that's one of the things I work in. And another is, um, you know, the bacteria in the gut, people make the parallel with an organ, and they think that um, a lot, all the chemicals are made by this organ in the gut. And these chemicals have effects on our brain, on our overall health, on our kidneys, on our liver. So, so we try to integrate, you know, we measure 1,500 species in the gut, Wow. And then we try to ask you know, what assembly of species are responsible for making what chemicals. Given the work you do with the microbiome, are there any ways you've actually changed your habits? Eating certain things, people worry about artificial sweeteners, some people worry about overprescription of antibiotics. Have you personally changed any of your habits? I found out that I had celiac, which I wouldn't have known. So for five years I haven't eaten wheat, for instance, okay. and I've had a much better um, uh, health since then. And it's funny because you were mentioning about gastroenteral. We think, I thought, oh, I have a normal you know, stomach and everything, but I had terrible headaches. But in mm. fact, the headaches were due to the wheat, but I didn't realize. And I hadn't even, you know, considered it until I started looking at the data and I thought, oh, that's what it is. And it was. And there's a nervous system in, right. your, in your gut anyway. Yeah, that's really interesting. Right. Is it hard, though, given how excited people get about this, to kind of separate fact from fiction using data? We are lucky. We have a, there's a lot of different sources, and we try to design our experiments very carefully. Mm -hmm. So we have a good handle on the noise, how to normalize the data. I work on the nitty gritty, which mm -hmm. I'm not going to you know <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> belabor with you. Yeah. But I like to try to. I respect the data. The data comes first, but it's also trying to make the data as good as possible. And I develop tools, software tools that. Um, biologists and med medical researchers can interact with their data with and so we make um, graphical representations of networks and things like that so we have tools which are browser based and easy to use that we hope that people will use our research because that's the main thing in the translational world it's not just saying we have this big messy data sets right. it's to say the researchers can stay in touch with their data so maybe you could say it's not how big your data is, no. it's what you do with it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I love that. Dr. Holmes, thanks so much for joining okay, me. Okay, thank you.